Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is a contextualized reading for Act 3 of Hamlet. And I'm just going to jump right in here. I've done several lectures so far. Uh, okay, so Act 3 opens with uh, reports from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern um, who've been spying on Hamlet. Uh, they're reporting back to the king and to Polonius. And then it quickly turns to a staged event by Polonius. And this is what I want people to, to sort of especially notice this summer, um, people who are in, um, taking my course for credit um, and we're thinking about um, uh, Shakespeare's defense of art, right? That's, that's one, that's the overarching theme for us this summer. And at the same time, I, what we're tracking at the more local level in the plays is the way that the plays are commenta commenting on the stage or on plays themselves, right? And we saw it in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, we saw the play within the play, which we're going to see again in um, this act. And uh, um, But we also see that Polonius is a kind of director, right? Polonius as a foil to Hamlet, Polonius... Um, uh, uses art, uses words, but um, he doesn't have the um, adeptness that uh, Hamlet has <clears throat> um, for playing with language and, and meaning with words. Um, and so at the same time, we see that Polonius is oftentimes, as a political intriguer, he's trying to stage various situations. So think of Polonius a little bit like a stage director himself, that these are competing directors, um, uh, Hamlet and Polonius. Um, Hamlet, so uh, um, <clears throat> Polonius even directs uh, Ophelia to pretend in Act 3 here to be reading a book of devotion, right? So he gives her a prop and tells her what she should be reading. <clears throat> this touches um, both Hamlet um, uh, and Claudius, though. Um, so when Hamlet famously sees Ophelia in this moment, um, he says, nymph in thy orisons, right? Be all my sins remembered. Um, uh, and he's drawn in. So Polonius's strategy kind of works, at least until um, the moment that we see that Hamlet um, uh, suspects that he's being watched. Um, it also touches Claudius, though, and so it's this really interesting moment where um, uh, Polonius has done something, maybe inadvertently, but he's put this prop into Ophelia's hand, um, and it touches Claudius's conscience. And we get the sense, um, uh, as an audience, we realize that, well, at least Claudius has a conscience. And we're going to come back to that with this guy, uh, Wilson Knight, who's a, a famous uh, Shakespeare critic from early in the 20th century in a minute. Um, uh, so Claudius is not just an evil genius type of figure. He knows what he's done. Um, he refers back to the slaying of Cain and Abel, so this ancient um, sibling slaying that's going on in the play. Um, yet another moment of the Euro-Christian um, uh, worldview um, that that's just sort of persists throughout the play. The references to the Old Testament there, um, and and particularly through conscience, right? So you might say, oh well, that Cain and the Ab Cain and Abel is in um, the Old Testament or the Tanakh, the Jew um, the the Jewish Bible, um, uh, which certainly it is. But I think that in Shakespeare's play, there's um, uh, the element of of con conscience. Um, which has been something that's been developed um, throughout the the um, Christian tradition through asceticism and um, uh, as part of very much Shakespeare's uh, um, time period, uh, the idea of conscience. <clears throat> so um, uh, we get the third soliloquy here pretty early on in the play. And I always think of this soliloquy as in quotes, right? So these are the most famous lines in Hamlet. We've heard them throughout history. Even if you've never read the play, you've probably heard to be or not to be. Um, and yet we know if we've been reading the play that it's not exactly a soliloquy because he's being watched <laughs> um, 
as uh, uh, as he as he does this. So if let's um, let's find the the place. So Hamlet enters. Um, Polonius says, "I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord." And so they they they're there. They're just hidden. And Hamlet does his soliloquy, which I'm going to read just out of respect to the language. I'm going to read the whole thing out um, as I do. Um, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. To sleep perchance to dream. Ay, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Let me read that again. I didn't read that sentence very well. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the pr proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the, the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft, you know, the fair Ophelia, nymph in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. So, okay, Hamlet here. Um, uh, I've talked a little bit about psychoanalytic language in my Midsummer Night's Dream um, lecture, and definitely psychoanalysis is a, is a um, not useful tool for reading through these Shakespeare plays. Um, at the same time, uh, I want to temper that with some historical contextual stuff, but definitely Hamlet here, we could say, um, evidences the death drive. Um, and uh, that's that's a, a term in psychoanalysis, so you can look it up. I'm not going to lecture just for time and brevity because I've got so much to get through today on the death drive. But that's an interesting th that would be an interesting thing to sort of research through and 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 then try to apply to Hamlet. It's a good um, way into his character. But he says, you know, directly, "Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to to die." That's like. Um, he notes, just for this section, if you've been focusing on dreams, like Midsummer Night's Dream, um, is that is a theme that you're working with um, uh, for research papers this summer or just for your thinking through Shakespeare? Um, note how dreams show up for Hamlet. Um, uh, he uses this metaphor of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, um, but uh, that comes right after he's been talking about dreams. And in Thomas Nash's T Terrors of the Night, which I'm, uh, I've mentioned a number of times this summer, um, I've got the book here. Um, uh, uh, there's Nash uses this a similar sort of um, metaphor. He says that dreams are like the arrows of thoughts, like that thoughts are like when we shoot an arrow and we miss the target and the arrow goes on. Um, that's what dreams are. Dr so uh, our thoughts that didn't hit the mark, that didn't land correctly throughout the day, they go on and they carry over into our dreams at night where they're being worked out and are unconscious. It's a really interesting way of thinking about dreams in this early, early book on dreams um, uh, uh, in the 1590s. <clears throat> so, um, 
I think that's just an interesting uh, 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 moment, and, and and it's maybe in the background here for Shakespeare writing Hamlet. Um, thought or conscience and consciousness is the thing that must give us pause, and we're so used to thinking about self-consciousness or the conscience in broader, at least U.S. culture, um, that we forget how inflected that thinking is from Euro-Christian tradition. So we don't tend to think about it as this particularly Christian idea, the, a theological idea. Um, we tend to think of it more broadly and secularized. And I want to emphasize the Euro-Christian um, uh, elements here of, of the history of, of conscience and consciousness. Um, if you want to read more about it, um, I would say turn to um, the lectures by Michel Foucault um, in the 70s, where he's um, particularly drawing on on uh, ancient tr traditions of asceticism and how Christians particularly develop that. And you can email me if you want specific texts from Foucault on that. Um, <clears throat> So thought or conscience or consciousness is the thing that must give us pause. Um, the death drive for Hamlet is assuaged by fear of the unknown and implicitly here fear of the almighty or conscience in man. That there's something in the Euro-Christian tradition, at least after St. Augustine, that is th that we have not we have original sin, which is a particular thing. And then we have the conscience as well. Um, to know that we have done something wrong, um, to be willfully evil um, is part of this, what, what's at work here in the Euro-Christian tradition. And so the reason why we don't kill ourselves is because we have a conscience or consciousness and that we have done deeds in our lives that would be like the arrows of life carrying over into the dream of death that might uh, bring God's judgment onto us. Um, so if soliloquy, if soliloquy one um, was external and nostalgic, remember, um, uh, so loving to my mother, he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Um, uh, and num and uh, solilo soliloquy two was just this like self berating inner directed um, uh, self loathing. Um, soliloquy th three here projects back outward and toward the future from uh, uh, within the internalized mind or conscience. So it's just a way to maybe think about the soliloquies in Hamlet: external, internal, and self self hating, and then. Uh, this meditation on conscience and consciousness. And again, Shakespeare critics always talk, out, talk about the maturity that shows up in Shakespeare's writing with Hamlet and his ability to pr present um, internal consciousness on stage. How do you stage something that's so invisible? Um, and uh, this is what he seems to be working with with the character of Hamlet. <clears throat> so... Um, we should also notice that it's Ophelia who draws him out of this like mind meditation thing. Wilson Knight, this uh, famous critic, um, and T.S. Eliot, if you know T.S. Eliot, um, a great poet, um, uh, uh, kind of is a big fan of this, Did it, wrote, wrote an introduction to, to Wilson Knight. So Wheel of Fire is the book that I'm referring to here. Wilson Knight and the Wheel of Fire, came out, which came out in 1930, notes that uh, while we may think of Hamlet's madness as at times calculated, he seems to actually lose control when it comes to Ophelia at various points in the play. Now, feel free to argue with Knight. That's what literary critics do. Um, but he would then point to the text and say, like, look, when Shakespeare interacts, or sorry, when Hamlet interacts with Ophelia, that's when he's most out of control. He's... Um, uh, so it's easy to see um, that others have colluded against Hamlet in this scene, right? Like, it's starting to feel like, I mean, there really is a conspiracy against the guy. You don't have to like Hamlet, but to see <laughs> that there's a conspiracy against him. Um, so even if we're uh, a, a sympathetic to Ophelia's situation, we know what happens to her later on in, in the play. 
Um, and, and we might think like what a jerk Hamlet is because he's not always nice to her. Um, uh, um, uh, there's also like, I think some sympathy that we can have for Hamlet because like the people are out to get him <laughs> and, and, um, to a certain extent, uh, Ophelia is playing along. She's playing the part that her father is m making her play. Um, so critics uh, such as Knight are a little bit harsh, I think, on Ophelia. Um, he says that Ophelia does, in truth, enclose a spirit as fragile and untrustworthy as her, earth, uh, as her earthly beauty. Um, I'm going to argue with that a little bit um, as we go on in this lecture. Um, I have a different reading of Ophelia, and I'm going to be building that, that into the, the reading here. Um, but to carry on with some interesting things that Knight says, um, and this is, of course, in 1930, he sees Hamlet as inhuman. And he sees Hamlet as a cynic, as death embodied. And he also sees Hamlet as a kind of Superman. Like Hamlet is kind of too smart for his own good. And this weirdly kind of makes Wilson Knight um, side with the flawed Claudius. And I think a normal reader, I think, is kind of like, what, Claudius the murderer? How, like, how can you side with Claudius? And, and these, this group is, who's, uh, has, has a kind of like conspiracy against Hamlet. Um, so I want to like, just because it's an interesting reading, I want to um, uh, give, give Wilson Knight a little bit of attention here. Um, so he's, uh, despite the fact that Hamlet is the cynic um, and that he's right, um, uh, so Wilson Knight says this, um, this is a quote, a balanced judgment is forced to pronounce ultimately in favor of life as contrasted with death for optimism and the healthy second rate and the healthy second rate rather than the nihilism of the Superman, uh, for he is not as the plot shows safe and he is not primarily because he is right. Otherwise, Claudius could have sw soon swept him from his path. If we think primarily of the state of Denmark, we are bound to applaud Claudius as he appears before us. He acts throughout with a fine steadiness of purpose. It's such an interesting um, reading. Now, you may or may not agree with I just want I just want to sit here with, with Wilson Knight here. So again he sees hamlet as nihilistic and a superman who represents death even if he's correct in his cynicism he sees the situation he sees through all facades um but the more second rate people the flawed people the people like claudius who kill their brother and but then are repent um are, are repent repenting um uh, they are more like the normal people, like that, like the, the normal everyday people. Um, uh, and if we're thinking about the world and what we need to have in the world, um, we can't all be Hamlets. Um, uh, at one of my favorite lines in literature comes from Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh, and Eeyore says, "We can't all, and some of us don't." <laughs> <laughs> um, and <laughs> there's maybe um, some of that, some Eeyore thinking um, going on here. Um, so uh, many critics have, have commented on, on the, that Hamlet both embodies a kind of death drive and that part of that death drive um, shows up in his arrested development and his inability to act in the way that we are never really sure how old Hamlet is. Um, and uh, he's stuck in that kind of depressed state. If you think about um, depression and motivation, right? Um, what Hamlet lacks is desire. Um, uh, and in psychoanalytic language, that desire means lack, right? So desire is the thing that I don't have. If I desire um, a hamburger for lunch, right? Then it's because I don't have it that it drives me or motivates me, which is why when somebody is depressed or they're mentally ill, um, melancholic in Shakespeare's language in, in the language applied to Hamlet so often, um, is uh, there's, there's a problem with one's ability to motivate.
oneself, right? There's a problem with their desire structure. And um, we know that this play like is existing because we're stuck in Hamlet's lack of desire, his lack of ability to do the revenge act that his author ghost um, or the devil, depending on how you want to read it, um, has charged him. And so uh, the, the plot of this play is really just structured around Hamlet's delay. Um, so there's a lot of Oedipal readings of Hamlet, if we could use psychoanalytic language, right? Um, so uh, the Oedipal stage in Freud is a stage that people work through. I mean, ideally you work through it, right? So the baby, um, just very briefly, um, uh, comes out of the mother and the mother and the mother is necessary for the baby's life, like the food source. If we're talking about a healthy baby, healthy mom, um, breastfeeding is going on. And um, the baby comes to see the mother as um, his or her entire world. Um, and it's necessary because that's like the food supply. You can't survive as a baby without mom. And so uh, as the baby gets older, mom starts directing attention to other children or to the father who ends up being a kind of third in this relationship that the baby doesn't quite know what to do with and um the baby's narcissistic the baby thinks like like me 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 you like know if you had a two-year-old for example um how narcissistic they can be mine mine and they're learning about possession or or they're saying no back to you um they have a real attitude sometimes um, this is all part of, of what would be part of the, Oedip the Oedipal drama. And what happens is the baby, you know, at least in the Freudian schema here, um, uh, obviously flawed in all sorts of other ways, and especially in gendered ways that I'm not going to talk about right now. Um, uh, but the baby sees the dad and knows that the dad gets mom's attention sometimes, whether or not the baby wants it. So the baby is in this power relationship with the father. Um, the father also becomes a kind of punisher in the um, Oedipal, um, in the Freudian Oedipal drama as well. So there's a way that it relates to law and stuff as well. And the idea is that the baby needs to work through this. The baby is not going to win out. The baby needs to find, to break away from the mother and find its own way in life. It needs to basically build a structure of desire towards growing up, towards other things. Now, you're maybe not going to get that deep thing that is, you know, at the core mom's love or something, and you start substituting other things for it. It could be Teletubbies or Crocs or light up shoes or whatever, the, like the moment of desire is, it starts layering and layering and layering on us as human beings, these, uh, um, substitutions for things that we maybe didn't get or that we wanted in certain ways when we were too young and too powerless to get them. And so moving through the Oedipal stage is actually sort of like like accepting and sort of moving away from the father, right? But if you, you know, and like there's something to what Freud is thinking if you've ever, if you're a grown up and you're having, you know, issues with your own parents or with issues with your dad. It's not so much about like wanting to have sex with your mother, like, um, like the Oedipal myth or anything. It's just that there, that, that there's something, um, uh, primordial for us as, as mammal beings that grow in, in, um, women's wombs. And when we come out of the womb, um, we start noticing a, a personality our sense of identity, which is a kind of doubling of ourself, like a way that I can think about myself. I learn language and in all of that sort of process of development, um, I'm learning about the rules of society. I'm learning about who, who tells me no and whether or not I should believe them and all of that sort of stuff that's, that's at our core. Um, so if we go back, um, to, to, um, the play here, which is stuck in Hamlet's arrested development. Um, many, many people, many, many productions have, have drawn out Oedipal themes. So even in like the Mel Gibson version, if you watch the, the movie version, um, in the 
bedroom with his mother like it's actually sexualized the relationship between um hamlet and his mother and this is all the impact that freud has had on our culture um uh and and our our reading of hamlet um so uh the death drive if we look at the death drive itself um because too many too many people just attribute it to freud it actually comes from um this woman named sabina spiel spielrein um and she wrote in 1912 an essay called destruction as the cause of coming into being um she was carl jung's patient and lover for a little while um and uh then she became a psychoanalyst and she was a pediatrician as well in her own right and she became an interlocutor with freud um and there have been i think there was the maybe a bad movie that was made about that sort of thing uh, i don't um uh recently um so the the um uh yeah it's been a the love story between um jung and this woman um uh sabina spielrein uh, is it's like well known, so you could look more into that. I'm not going to go into it today. <laughs> um, I just uh, think that like if you wanted to look more into the death drive, um, you could maybe read her essay first rather than just taking it up with Freud. Freud deals it with, with it in the book called Beyond the P Pleasure Principle. Um, so back to the play itself in the, Act Three, um, uh, it, which has been Polonius's stage. Um, Ophelia is breaking up with Hamlet. She, yes, she's had this scare already um, where Hamlet kind of came into her room with his stuff all disheveled and then left the room and it was weird and eerie. Um, uh, but she, um, and she'd been told that she couldn't have contact and Polonius believes that all of Hamlet's madness is back to his own forbidding of his daughter to hang out with her. Um, uh, Ophelia breaks up with him and she, she gives him his letters back, right? So, and then we get an exchange about beauty and about virtue and about old stock or original sin. And Hamlet is playing on the idea of prayers or orisons. Um, he says, I loved you not because I was tainted with sin and therefore unworthy of your love, Ophelia. Um, so you should get thee to a nunnery, he says. And it's followed by more self-loathing and berating. Um, so uh, this is his response. He, he's like, I did love you once. And she says, yes, I, I, my lord, I thought, I thought you did. Um, uh, and then he says, but I didn't because I wasn't me. I was this flawed person. And so this kind of Euro-Christian guilt thing is going on with Hamlet here. And I think that you need to sort of understand it and in, in the, the, the fact that he's directly referencing original sin here. If you don't get that element, um, I don't think that you understand the, the sort of the full, I guess, pregnancy of the meaning. I mean, that's an, that's an interesting word to bring in here too. I do think that there's a way to read um, uh, Ophelia as being pregnant that as it was already allude, alluded to in an earlier chapter or an earlier act. Um, uh, he, um, at some point in here, Hamlet figures out that, um, they're being watched. He asks where her father is. She lies. And so this is just, I'm not, I'm not with Wilson Knight on really, on uh, his view of Ophelia entirely, but it is true that she directly lies to Hamlet in this moment. And Hamlet turns nasty. And he turns misogynist, like woman hating, right? But Ophelia here has sympathy um, and also kind of mimics Dido from Virgil's Aeneid. And we have to kind of look, think back to Act um, 2 to earlier references um, to Dido showing up. Um, so if you go back to my earlier lectures, um, and then to see Hamlet being cast in this kind of uh, if she's Dido, then he's Aeneas. He's the hero. And I think that that uh, Shakespeare's playing with a typological reading. So this is what we do in, in mythological reading. And it does come from from uh, Christian readings of texts as well, where um, they would see Christians would see uh, Jesus Christ as a kind or a type of Adam. 
right? And this shows up in the New Testament. And so typological readings are about um, sort of mapping um, new versions of different characters onto others. And Shakespeare does this all the time. He does it with Pyramus and Thisbe, with the, the characters from Ovid's Metamorphoses or Greek um, stories. Um, and he makes he reworks them into his characters. So in this moment, I think that there's this breakup scene that's happening. But what's interesting is uh, Ophelia is breaking up with Hamlet. Hamlet turns nasty. Um, maybe you've had a fight with somebody that you were breaking up with before. Um, Claudius. Um, so Ophelia. Um, um, is hurt by this, but she 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 goes through it. Um, so so she 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 has sympathy. And what I what I mean is that is when she says, "Oh my God, he's out of his mind," and she she repeats it, um, the lines a couple of times. Um, and um, um, oh, help him, you sweet heavens! Oh, heavenly powers, restore him! Right, that's what she repeats over. over. So um, we know that, like, I mean, it, I don't I don't think that she's Na being that nasty to him uh, um, honestly and I don't know how much he believes her breakup um, I think that Hamlet definitely like as, especially as he suspects what's going on and then he's very angry and he acts out um, <clears throat> Claudius suspects that there's something more cunning in Hamlet's soul here too he decides he's like he, he he's on to the fact that Polonius like Polonius is wrong in attributing all of Hamlet's madness to Ophelia. And uh, um, Claudius knows it, and, and we start getting this plotting against Hamlet by Claudius. It really, I mean, it was already maybe there in Act One, but it really starts taking shape. And so maybe this is what um, uh, Wilson Knight means when he says that Claudius is steadfast. Um, and he's, he keep he always moves forward towards what he wants to do and he's moving forward towards he wants to get rid of Hamlet um, uh, so at this point he decides to send him to England because Hamlet is has become a threat to the state Polonius then still sees neglected love and his command is the cause of Hamlet's madness um, he's really um, narcissistic i think as a character um polonius he stages another meeting with gertrude and um wh where hamlet is going to co um, come and talk to his mom and this time polonius will be the spy and so he's he just can't give it up uh so we move to scene 3.2 hamlet here is direct uh d directs the player to use subtlety and um so again, if we're focusing on what is important to Shakespeare in terms of art, Act 3, Scene 2, we get a lot of words, at least out of Hamlet's mouth, for what, uh, um, how things should be. Now remember back to Act 2 where we had the discussion with the boy players and that, that is going on in London. Um, and Hamlet becoming a director here, again, we don't know exactly how old Hamlet is, and so Hamlet might be a satirical boy player, too. Um, uh, we, we don't quite know. Um, but we get, at least in his directions, um, something that sounds more mature and something more something older and that might align with the players that he likes. Um, uh, so he's given haven to these players who can't perform in London because they're not doing the hip thing right now. So he directs the player to use subtlety. He says no grand gestures or elocutionary rhetoric, which was a big part of um, rhetoric in the Renaissance, was um, uh, the ways that we should stand when we want to convey different emotions to people. There's all sorts of books about um, Renaissance rhetoric that you can look at. Um, also um, figures of speech, just tons and tons of figures of speech, an explosion in um, uh, the English language of uh, um, references to different kinds of turns and tropes in language because um, at the beginning of the 1500s, the um, uh, writers in English felt like the English language was deprived of words, just words to express. Um, and so by the later um, 
fifteen hundreds, there's there's just an influx of all sorts of, especially Italian words from the Renaissance, that um, uh, uh, literary words, words about language, that show up. <clears throat> so um, again, we want to consider this in relation to the satirical players and the um, in the War of the Theaters mentioned in the last um, uh, uh, reading video. Polonius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern enter um, enter the scene here. But Hamlet says to fetch the king and queen. So um, Horatio then enters and Hamlet asks for his attention. So this is an interesting moment, I think, because remember, he had sworn them all to secrecy and he wouldn't tell them what the ghost told him. But Hamlet is not trusting his own mind here. And so he wants Horatio to second him as well. Um, so he's very, Horatio is very much his confidant. Um, uh, he commends Horatio for not being passion's slave. Um, and we might want to compare the reference here to fortune um, earlier um, with earlier interactions with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in Acts 2. One could, I think, um, easily stage Hamlet and Horatio as lovers. Um, and this has probably been done somewhere. I just, I'm not aware of it. Let me know if you know of, uh, of a staging. But I, I do think that um, there, there's uh, a bond of intimacy going on with uh, Horatio and Hamlet. Um, uh, Hamlet asks Horatio to be a witness to the king's reactions, but not necessarily a spy. Hamlet asks Horatio to sit in the theater, but just like to be very attentive to what, what um, uh, he's not hiding behind um, a tapestry like um, Polonius might be doing. Uh, so Hamlet's response to Claudius um, uh, here uh, also alludes to the fact that he's heir apparent um, to the throne, um, and he uh, um, and and that he doesn't believe Claudius's promises. Um, so he calls himself a chameleon who's eating air. This is um, Act Two, uh, uh, or sorry, Scene Two, Act Three, um, about line eighty-five. Um, here, let me just find that here. Uh, King says, how fair is our cousin Hamlet? Um, excellent in faith of the chameleon's dish. I eat the air, promise crammed. You feed, um, uh, you cannot feed capons, so. And as our no my notes say here, um, uh, uh, capons are castrated roosters who are crammed with food to, to um, made, made fat at the dinner table. Um, and so... Um, the king says, I have nothing to nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. Um, uh, so you, you're not answering my question. Um, he's a little bit annoyed, of course. Um, but Hamlet is saying this in, in Hamlet's way, right? He's saying that he that he's not um, able to succeed. He's not able that Claudius is blocking his succession to or his ascension to the throne. Polonius in here says that he was an actor once and that he played Julius Caesar, um, who in real life was assassinated by a man named Brutus. Hamlet responds that it was stupid of the brute, who play on idiot, who killed so capital a calf um, there. Um, and so he, he makes Polonius into um, a kind of animal sacrifice in this particular moment. Um, and he's basically saying, like, I couldn't believe, like, um, like hey, Polonius probably wouldn't make a good um, Julius Caesar. <coughs> Hamlet um, uh, starts acting um, very manic with Ophelia in this scene. And so there's all sorts of sexual language. We know country matters. Um, uh, he uh, alludes to you know, collapses time between um, two hours and two months since his um, father's death. Uh, and then um, we get the reference to the hobby horse here as well. Um, the players uh, mime the argument of the play. And so this is something that happened. Um, uh, again, a way to, to think about this is that we like the plot doesn't matter. We know in the beginning of the play, everything that, that like the actions that happen in the play. And what we're focusing on 
is how the actions unfold. So that's definitely part of the way that things were staged in, in uh, Shakespeare's time. Um, uh, and not just Shakespeare, that's, uh, it's in other plays as well. Um, so uh, the play then runs and we have Hamlet, you know, he's inserted his own, this is his production. Um, uh, and there are various interruptions by nobility. And this again echoes Midsummer Night's Dream, if you think towards the end of Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, so we get this kind of a side commentary by the nobility. Um, we get more sexual innuendos with uh, Ophelia throughout. Um, and it's smutty, but it's flirtatious here. So um, this scene, I mean, depending on how you want to read Ophelia, like does Hamlet believe that Ophelia really broke up with him? Um, is he just being mean to her? Um, he is being smutty in public, um, but uh, she goes along with him a little bit. Um, and I don't think that she's so much a pawn here. Um, I think that she has some, some uh, more, maybe more agency than some people want to give her. Um, Claudius gets upset in the play, of course, so the, Ham the mousetrap play works. And then we get Hamlet, um, who seems to be quoting now um, throughout the scene from Lost Ballads. Um, and so again, this speaks to the kind of um, uh, argument that Emma Smith from Oxford has made about the play, that the play, that Hamlet is constantly nostalgic for the past. He's looking backwards to a better time. Um, after the play, Hamlet tells Horatio that he now believes the ghost. Um, uh, so what he's been ruminating on this whole time is whether or not, you know, that maybe the ghost was the devil. We've seen that kind of language, but now he believes that the ghost is right, um, that Claudius is guilty. Uh, and so this is kind of a step towards some sort of action. Um, and then we get a nasty exchange with Guildenstern um, and this whole idea of the pipe. Like, would you play, why would you play upon me as if I were a pipe? Do you know? And he's forcing, um, uh, uh, Guildenstern to, to to play the pipe. He's like, you play it, you play it, right? Um, and ambition is the theme here as well. Remember, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz presented themselves as being about fortune's middle parts, but what they're actually doing is they're scheming because they have ambition and they want um, to move up socially in rank and prestige and get money. Um, so Polonius interrupts here. Um, uh, uh, the, um, Hamlet kind of, um, uh, you know, giving Guildenstern a piece of his mind. Um, and then we get the witching hour. So it's after midnight, right? So we know, we know that that, um, and the witching hour is sometimes later than midnight, but we know that ghosts start coming out after midnight from earlier Shakespeare plays. So the witching hour foreshadows here, um, that the ghost is going to appear, um, in a later scene. And Hamlet says um, he's going to go to his mom, he's going to talk to her in the chamber, and he's going to speak daggers to her, but he's going to use none. He's intentionally going to be really mean to his mom. Claudius tells, uh, so act, C, uh, act three, scene three, Claudius tells Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to prepare for England. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are acting more like courtiers here. So we see that they've kind of risen a little bit in terms of of what their um, role is in relationship to Hamlet. Um, and so notice that the Wheel of Fortune comes back here. Um, Rosencrantz and, um, seems to conflate the wheel with the burdens of the king as he's trying to, you know, he's basically sucking up to Claudius. Um, this alludes to the king's two bodies, which is something that we will come back to in Richard II. Yeah, uh, like the king is dead, long live the king, that kind of statement. And it has to do with the succession of one king to another. Um, what they're saying here, what Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are saying is that they they want to keep this king at the top of the wheel. They don't want him to fall because then that's going to screw up all of their um, chances to um, uh, gain the things that they are so ambitious for. So um, Claudius gives a soliloquy here in um, scene three um, where he again expresses his repentance 
again, um, there's an allusion directly to Cain and Abel, um, and he tries repentance. Hamlet sees him in this moment, um, apparently earnest in his prayers, and kind of believes that Claudius is earnest um, because he says um, uh, uh, he doesn't want to kill him in this moment. Um, interestingly, Claudius is praying doubles Ophelia's pr false prayers when she's reading in the book of devotions that her dad has given to her, right? Uh, so that's just an interesting kind of doubling going on in the in this um, act. Uh, Hamlet is strangely um, is strangely Catholic in this moment because he this is when he decides to hold off killing the king because apparently the king's conscience is clean and uh, Hamlet wants him to um, he, uh, he doesn't want to put him into a kind of purgatory type of state he wants to send him to hell um, and if he, he is really according to you know Catholic doctrine, if, if he really is re repentful for his sins, um, uh, then he might go to heaven. Um, depends on, you know, how you want to read the fact that he's committed a mortal sin, right, <laughs> um, by killing his brother. So we go to um, scene four here. Um, this is in Polonius's chamber, um, or the, sorry, in the queen's chamber, and Polonius is hidden again. So again, now we're back to the Polonius plot. Um, uh, and so many versions, I've already said, um, emphasize sexual tension here between Hamlet and his mother, and so they're playing on the Oedipal themes there. Um, uh, but he holds her face to a mirror, and he says, um, where, um, where you may see the inmost part of you. And so he's trying to draw on her conscience, and this is like this really beautiful way that, Ham that Hamlet the play and it's dealing with the theme of conscience and internality stages that expression and uses the mirror. Um, <clears throat> Hamlet, um, uh, at this point, the Hamlet, uh, uh, Hamlet's mom gets upset. Polonius screams um, and uh, Hamlet slays him without knowing who it is. Um, Hamlet here falsely accuses his mother of his father's murder, unless you believe that um, Gertrude was in on the plot, but it doesn't quite seem that way to me in the reading, in my reading of the play. Um, uh, and then he calls her a whore. Uh, the ghost at this point enters, and the ghost is in his nightgown in this moment. And what's interesting here in this scene is that only Hamlet sees the ghost, as opposed to the beginning of the play. Uh, um, Gertrude, his mom, does not see the ghost. Um, and so we're left to wonder as an audience whether or not the ghost is really a figment of Hamlet's imagination at this point. Um, but he comes in and he's in his nightgown um, and different plays have staged this, this scene in, in various way, ways as well. Um, sort of most recently um, with a more loving family situation. I think that David Tannen I can't remember his name right now. Um, the um, recent version um, shows a kind of loving uh, relationship um, as opposed to the Mel Gibson version. Uh, only Hamlet sees the ghost um, uh, and he's trying to convince uh, Gertrude, Hamlet is, um, to repent and then to be celibate. Gertrude seems to agree um, uh, and Hamlet alludes to already knowing the plot against him that's involving Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, now that's a little bit interesting because we get later on in Act 5, he tells Horatio another kind of story around this. So it could be a little inconsistency in the play. Um, it's just an interesting play, thing to, to play with as you're reading um, the play. Um, and that's going to take um, us to the end of Act 3 and the end of this particular, this uh, contextualized reading. Lots of things to really think about in Act 3. Um, I certainly haven't covered so many things um, that, that we could dig into, especially with more with this play within the play, the lines from that. There's a lot more work to be done. Um, 
uh, uh, here as well. Um, and um, just one more thing. What, one, of, one of my aims today was just to get a Hamlet critic and like Wilson Knight in here as well. Um, and really to see Hamlet like he is one of the genius things that Shakespeare seems to have done here is that he puts us into the mind of the person who is the threat to the state of Denmark. And so the question then becomes, how much are we supposed to sympathize with this hero or not? Uh, so Wilson Knight very interestingly says that no, like the tragedy of Hamlet, if we read it correctly as a tragedy, is that we don't want to be like Hamlet. We should be more like the flawed characters, or at least for Wilson Knight, um, Claudius. I'll leave you to ponder that on your own um, for, for uh, whether or not you believe Wilson Knight there, but it is at least an intriguing thought. Um, it's also intriguing to think of Hamlet being cast as a kind of Superman. Um, National Socialism was on the rise when, when Wilson Knight wrote his piece. Um, it's definitely a reference to Nietzsche, and we know that the Nazis used um, Nietzsche probably in, in ways that Nietzsche would have not liked um, in their idea of the sort of Nazi Superman. Um, but it's interesting to um, to draw it out, like to... to, to um, if we don't identify with Hamlet, or if Hamlet is the bad guy, um, is Hamlet um, a kind of Superman or um, Aryan sort of Nazi state, and the normal people are flawed, the second-rate people um, are the people of a democracy, and that what we need in a democracy is people, we can't have everybody, the smart, just the smart people and the elite people um, running the show all of the time they might be too dangerous. They're not, they might be unreliable for us in a democracy. Just really so many layers of things to be thinking about here. Um, and so whether or not we agree with Wilson Knight, I think that's what criticism does, is it really gets our brains going and <laughs> thinking about um, uh, what's really going on in the play. Uh, okay, I'll leave you there for today and catch up with you again in Act 4 and 5. I'll probably condense them um, into one video this week again. Uh, thanks for watching and listening. As always, have a great day.